Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the past few videos, we've looked at molecular orbitals and energy level diagrams. So far, we've only been looking at MOs for diatomic molecules, both homonuclear and heteronuclear molecules. But what about larger molecules? Today, we'll start looking at energy level diagrams for some simple large molecules. Let's look at the simplest possible case containing three nuclei an H3 molecule consisting of three hydrogen atoms in a straight line. This may sound like a molecule that can't possibly exist. In fact, it does exist, especially in gas clouds in deep space, but it is true that H3 is unstable and has a lifetime of under a microsecond. We'll see soon why it's so short-lived, but let's start by thinking about its orbitals. H3 consists of three hydrogen atoms, each with one 1s atomic orbital. As we've seen in previous videos, when atoms come together to form a molecule, the number of MOs in the molecule is equal to the total number of atomic orbitals in the individual atoms. So the H3 molecule has three molecular orbitals. To find the shapes of these MOs, we need to think about the sine of the wave function at each atom. It turns out that there's a simple procedure we can use to find out how the sine of the wave functions that represent each MO vary along the different parts of the molecule. Here's how we do it. First, for each molecular orbital, we draw a picture of the three atomic orbitals for the molecule. For example, the H3 molecule has three different MOs, so we draw three different pictures each of which consists of three overlapping circles representing a 1s atomic orbital. In the second step, we draw vertical lines in each picture, which represent the location of nodes in the molecular orbitals. You might remember that some MOs have nodes like this sigma u star orbital that we saw when we looked at the H2 molecule in the last video. Anyway, each molecular orbital will have a different number of nodes. The first picture will have no nodes, so we draw no vertical line on that one. The second will have one node, which will divide the molecule into two halves, so we draw one vertical line in the center of the molecule. In the last molecule, we have two nodes, so we draw two vertical lines that divide the molecule into thirds. In the third step, we draw a sine wave over each molecule. The sine wave starts at the left end of the first atomic orbital and ends at the right end of the last atomic orbital. If we draw an x-axis through the center of the molecule, the sine wave passes through this axis whenever we draw a node line. So for example, the first molecule has no nodes, so the sine wave starts at the left end, rises, and then meets the axis again at the right end. In the second molecule, there's one node, so the sine wave rises, passes through the axis at the node, and then returns to the axis at the end of the molecule. Finally, the sine wave on the third molecule looks like this. In the next step, we assign each atomic orbital a positive or negative sign. If the atomic orbital is in an area where the sine wave is mostly above the horizontal axis, the wave function for that atomic orbital is positive. If the sine wave is mostly below the axis, the wave function is negative. And if the sine wave on the atomic orbital is above and below the axis for equal amounts, then we assign that atomic orbital a value of zero. So, for example, in the first molecule, the sine wave is above the axis for all three atomic orbitals, so we give them all a positive sign. In the second molecule, the sine wave on the first orbital is above the axis, and for the right orbital it's below the axis, so these get a positive and negative sign, respectively. But in the sine wave on the middle orbital is above and below the axis for equal lengths, so this orbital gets a value of zero. Finally, the sine wave on the third molecule is above the axis for the first orbital, below it on the middle orbital, and above it for the last orbital. 
Now that we know how the sine of the wave function changes sine for each MO, we can give the MOs a symmetry label. Each orbital is connected by a sigma bond, so that's the first part of the symbol. The signs in the first MO are symmetric with respect to the center of the molecule. As you might remember from video 28, that makes this a Girard orbital, so it gets a subscript G. The signs in the second molecule are opposite with respect to the center of the molecule. So this is an Ungerad orbital, which means this MO gets a subscript U. Finally, the last MO is symmetric with respect to the center, so it's another Girard orbital. Finally, let's figure out whether the MOs are bonding, antibonding, or non-bonding. We do that by looking at each adjacent pair of atomic orbitals. If the sign on both is the same, it's a bonding interaction. If the signs are opposite, it's an antibonding interaction. And if one of the signs is actually zero, it's a non-bonding interaction. Overall, the MO is a bonding MO if there are more bonding interactions than antibonding ones. It's an antibonding MO if there are more antibonding interactions than bonding ones. And it's a non-bonding MO if the number of bonding and antibonding interactions are equal. For example, the first MO features two bonding interactions and no antibonding ones. So this is a bonding MO. The next MO has no bonding or antibonding interactions, so this is a non-bonding MO. And the last MO has two antibonding interactions and no bonding ones, so this is an antibonding MO. If we actually look at an image of these three molecular orbitals, here's what they look like. In these pictures, you can see the one node in the middle molecular orbital and two nodes in the right-hand orbital. You can also see how the sine of the wave function changes on opposite sides of each node. Finally, let's draw an energy level diagram for this molecule. The three molecular orbitals have these relative energies. The bonding MO has the lowest energy and the antibonding one has the highest energy. The molecule has three electrons, so we put three arrows in the orbitals. There's one pair in the lowest orbital, and the third one goes in the non-bonding orbital. How stable is this molecule? We can find out by calculating the bond order per bond. That is, dividing the bond order by the number of bonds. As you might remember from the last video, we get the bond order by counting the number of electrons in bonding orbitals, subtracting the number in antibonding orbitals, and dividing by two. In this case, there are two electrons in bonding orbitals and none in antibonding ones, so that gives us a bond order of one. So, to get the bond order per bond, we divide this by two, because there are two bonds. That gives us a result of one half. A general rule of thumb is that in order for a molecule to be stable, the bond order per bond must be one or higher. Since this molecule has a bond order per bond of just one half, that means H3 is an unstable molecule. Let's try another example, another linear molecule, H6. H6 consists of six hydrogen atoms, each with a 1s atomic orbital. So, the H6 molecule has six molecular orbitals. Now we'll apply the method we just used for the H3 molecule. First, for each molecular orbital, we draw a picture of the six atomic orbitals of the molecule. H6 has six different MOs, so we draw six different pictures, each of which consists of six overlapping circles representing the 1s atomic orbitals. In step two, we draw vertical lines in each picture to represent the location of nodes in the molecular orbitals. The first picture will have no nodes, the second will have one node, which will divide the molecule into two halves. The next molecule will have two nodes, so we draw two vertical lines that divide the molecule into thirds, and so on. In the third step, we draw a sine wave over each molecule. 
The first molecule has no nodes, so the sine wave starts at the left end, rises, and then meets the axis again at the right end. In the second molecule, the sine wave rises, passes through the axis at the node, and returns to the axis at the end of the molecule, and so on. In the next step, we assign each atomic orbital a positive or negative sign based on whether the sine wave is above or below the axis for each atomic orbital. So, for example, in the first molecule, the sine wave is above the axis for all the atomic orbitals, so we give them all a positive sign. In the second molecule, the sine wave on the first three orbitals is above the axis, and for the last three it's below the axis. We continue in this way for the rest of the orbitals. The fifth one is the trickiest. We have six atomic orbitals, and there are four vertical lines, so these divide the molecule into five parts. Each part is 1.2 atomic orbitals long, so we can use that fact to realize that the first orbital is positive, the second is negative, both of the middle orbitals are positive, the next is negative, and the last one is positive. Now we can give the MOs a symmetry label. Each orbital is connected by sigma bonds, so that's the first part of the symbol. The signs in the first MO are symmetric with respect to the center of the molecule, so it gets a subscript G. The signs in the second molecule are opposite with respect to the center of the molecule, so this is an Ungerod orbital, and it gets a subscript U. When we do this for the rest of the MOs, here's what we get. Finally, we figure out whether the MOs are bonding, antibonding, or non-bonding. The first MO features only bonding interactions and no antibonding ones, so this is a bonding MO. The next MO has four bonding interactions and one antibonding, so this is another bonding MO. The third MO has three bonding and two antibonding interactions, so that's also a bonding MO. The next one has four non-bonding interactions and one antibonding, so that's an antibonding MO. The fifth has four antibonding and one bonding interaction, so that's another antibonding MO. And the last one has five antibonding interactions and no bonding ones, so that's an antibonding MO. Finally, we can draw an energy level diagram for the molecule. The molecular orbitals have these relative energies. The bonding MOs have the lowest energy, and the antibonding ones have the highest. The molecule has six electrons, so we put six arrows in the orbitals. There's a pair in each of the bonding orbitals. So how stable is the molecule? To find the bond order, we use this equation. There are six electrons in bonding orbitals and none in antibonding ones, so that gives us a bond order of three. To get the bond order per bond, we divide this by five, because there are five bonds. That gives us a result of 3 fifths. That makes this a bit more stable than the H3 molecule, which had a bond order per bond of 1 half, but it's still less than 1, so this is another unstable molecule. Well, that's enough new material for now. It's about time for another exam for you. I hope that goes well. When we meet again, we'll start looking at a few more topics related to spectroscopy. It's one of the most practical applications of quantum mechanics. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.